right. And we're going to go ahead and open up. Actually, let's, let's read a verse or two first, then we'll open up with a word of prayer. Once you're in Galatians 1, look at verse number 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we thank you for the gift of salvation through the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would help us to uh, not be ashamed of preaching the gospel. And Lord, I pray that in this Sunday school hour, you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would help the listeners to learn something that would glorify you and honor you. And Lord, I ask right now that you would magnify your word and that your spirit would descend upon this place and help us to understand. Lord, there are those out there that preach another gospel and your word says, let them be accursed. I pray that you would give us wisdom now and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, the title of our Sunday school lesson, as we're continuing our series called Spooky Cults, or spooky cults, as it's October and people are putting spooky stuff in their yard. I want to ask, what's wrong with Mormons? And here's the thought, the real closing thought is how to get a Latter-day Saint saved. Most people that are part of what's commonly called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they used to be called Mormonites. Then they were just called Mormons for years, a term they themselves embraced. Now they insist on being called Latter-day Saints, or LDS. A quote from Wikipedia, it says, New religious movements emerged during the Second Great Awakening, such as Adventism, Dispensationalism, and the Latter-day Saint movement. In America, during the Second Great Awakening, the first was primarily in Europe, the Second Great Awakening created this new system of belief. A lot of them were connected to the Stone and Campbell revivals, the Restoration Movement. And out of that, we get uh, Freemasonry came first, but then we actually see LDS and SDA, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Brethren Movement, Dispensationalism, they all come from the same family tree. The Church of God that will have a, a baptismal regeneration, they're all tied in a sense um, to the same family tree. So in the 1830s, that was the order, the LDS, the JWs, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Brethren, the Dispensationalists. A lot of them were tied to the Millerites. William Miller was a man that predicted the end, and he put a date on it. And then he said, oh, well, let's move that date by one year, just in case I'm wrong. And so many of these spinoffs were uh, tied to the Millerites. Now, the origin of the Mormon church as again, today it's called the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it angers me that they use the name Jesus because they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Joseph Smith himself, he was the founder, Joseph Smith Jr. He was arrested a dozen times. He was fleeing from the law, from justice. And then he said he was visited by an angel named Moroni from Kolob, they told him that there was a golden Bible down in the ground. Uh, Joseph Smith then used a seeing stone. This is a form of sorcery or witchcraft. He claims he used this stone to be able to interpret the Bible. There's never been an eyewitness other than Joseph Smith to say they saw the golden plates or this golden Bible. He alone claims to have saw it. Um, he was arrested for using this seeing stone to deceive people out of money. He would go to their land and say, I used a stone and I think there's something here. And they would dig it up. And, Aha, I found some treasure. Now pay me some more and I'll go through your whole property and tell you if there's anything more. And so he would, you know, set people up. He would have arrested in New York and many other places. He has a very shady past, but it's not just about his past. Joseph Smith preached another gospel. In Galatians 1, again, verse 8, but though we 
or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Look, you have the Word of God. If you say, man, I had a dream and I saw an angel and they told me something different, I'd say, be careful of that. It's probably a lying spirit. It's probably a devil. It's probably, it could be your own imagination. I would say, well, did you watch any scary movies and eat pizza last night? Because maybe that's actually what's going on. Maybe it really was that he saw a spirit manifested that gave him all this new revelation and it was truly a devil, much like Mohammed. There's a lot of similarities between Mormonism and Mohammedism as they both come from a lying spirit. In Galatians 1.9, he says, as we said before, so say I now again. Again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. That means, listen, this man is condemned. He's damned according to God. Uh, stay away from them. Don't listen to them. Warn people about them. And it's very important that we warn fellow Christians about Mormons. The average Christian knows nothing about Mormons. Many years ago, through a friend at church, he had a friend he grew up with in a Baptist church, and this young man who knew nothing about Mormons, he married a Mormon girl because she seemed pure and virtuous, and she dressed the way that he thought was the right way, and he was attracted to her holiness per se, but they were both very low-level, shallow Christians. Well, no sooner than they get married, she's pregnant, they have a child, and now she falls under conviction of her tradition that they need to be in the Mormon church. They need to go to one of these temples. Now he was in a fractured marriage where he is a weak Christian, could not uh, demonstrate from the Bible what was wrong with Mormonism before he married her or after, and the result was a divided household going in different directions, preaching different gospels, believing in a different Jesus. I want to give you several strange things that Mormons teach. They teach it from another testament. Um, I didn't bring it. I have a couple of them in my office. Their, uh, their book of Mormon, this is the Joseph Smith Bible. I do have a, book of, a couple book of Mormons in there. There's different variations of them. A couple strange things that they teach. There are multiple heavens, they teach. There are multiple gods. Uh, Jesus and Satan are brothers. Uh, if you were black, you were cursed from the beginning. Mormons were racist until they made a ruling. They had, oh, we had a new prophecy in the 1920s, and we decided we better stop being racist. They believe in multiple marriages to be able to go to the best of eternal heavens. Joseph Smith had 32 wives. Brigham Young, his, uh, his the guy that followed him, had 55. They shared many wives. It really is a culture of abuse. It is. Joseph Smith is looked at as a god, that he had the ability to become a god, that he is a god, and that he holds the keys to salvation today. Joseph Smith taught that you can become a god if you are a good Mormon. They taught that God the Father and God the Mother were co-equal. Her name is Elah and that they had a bunch of spirit babies, and one day we'll do the same thing if we're good Mormons. Very bizarre stuff. They wear secret underwear with Masonic symbolism on the knee and on the breast, which shows the square and the compass because it comes from Freemasonry. They teach that you can get baptized for a dead person and bring them up to one of the levels of general salvation, but not to the ultimate uh, eternal, the best heaven, per se. They teach blood atonement. Now, in the Bible, the blood atonement means that Jesus shed his blood for your sins. You deserve death and hell. Jo well, Joseph Smith taught that what that meant was, if somebody left the Mormon church and they spake against it, that you are justified, according to his scriptures, to go and kill them and atone their sin by killing them. There are many cases of Mormons murdering people that left the Mormon church, especially when they spoke out against the abuse, killing the detractors for leaving. They believe in a secret spiritual marriage ceremony with many earthly brides that will eventually be your eternal brides. They call it being sealed. It's a very common practice that a prominent Mormon will seal himself to other Mormons' children, daughters, while they're young. There's been many reports of abuse through this system. They have a 
transparent side where once you're a Mormon, you see the, the ritual and the ceremony, but then there's always the discussion of what really goes on behind the scenes. Joseph Smith himself started this, that he had a revelation from Moroni that uh, really to go to heaven to be right with God, we had to reinstitute the order of polygamy. In Mormonism, you also see polyamory. You see multiple mixed marriages, some very bizarre things. Today, the fundamentalist Mormons, which are the hyper-conservative, they believe every word of what Joseph Smith said, they hold to it strictly while the uh, more liberal mainstream Mormons say, well, that was a teaching for another dispensation, but that's not for today. It's kind of bizarre. Um, secret Masonic handshakes, the token of Melchizedek, and the token, the Aaronic priesthood tokens, and these are literal Masonic handshakes that have been exposed. Uh, there was a man by the last name of Morgan that exposed the Masons and they killed him. Uh, his wife ended up marrying Joseph Smith and then she later departed and married someone else. There are pentagrams on every Mormon temple upside down satanic stars. And in my personal experience from actually spending time in Salt Lake City, they love Halloween. They love darkness and witchcraft. They don't see any problem with it. If you would go to Revelation chapter 22. I want to tell you about the first 9-11 massacre that took place in America. It was called the Mountain Meadows Massacre, where Mormons dressed up as Native American Indians, and they slaughtered over 120 Americans that were passing through. Man, woman, child. They kidnapped the remaining children and adopted them, bringing into their Mormon households and kept them for many years. There's a public monument to it. There have been people that have pro were prosecuted and put to death over it. Brigham Young himself being indicted and that he was to blame. But of course, there was, um, it took time. And I, some people would say he knew nothing about it. At that time, Brigham Young had declared martial law in the territory as he had declared war against the nation of the United States. The Mormons used to be at war against the United States. The Mormons teach a public profession that's called the burning in the bosom. Who's heard about it? The burning in the bosom. When you read about that in their scriptures, it's actually talking about how Joseph Smith's interpreter decided that he would translate for himself, and he started writing stuff, and then Joseph Smith is rebuking him, saying, if you think you know something, you have to funnel it through me, and if you get that burning of the bosom, it's from God. It's a very bizarre passage, but that's where it originates in their own writings. And that burning of the bosom, the way it looks today is they'll come to their, their hall, and they will get there and they will sit in their, it's like a lodge, and somebody will get up and say, I believe the testimony of Joseph Smith. I prayed or I read the scriptures and I felt the burning of the bosom. It's literally a sense. It is a feeling. They are looking for an emotional response or a physical feeling, and they claim that that is spiritual evidence that the Book of Mormon is true. I have to tell you, human beings through psychology can convince themselves of a lot of things. Uh, there's things such as being psychosomatic, um, or, or there are things as sugar pills where you can convince yourself the power of the mind is powerful over your body. And if you get yourself worked up in an emotional state, you can feel something physically in your body. There is power over the flesh with your mind. I believe that's a lot of the instances. Many people come out and say, I never felt anything. Why this is important. If you've ever stopped a Mormon and interacted with them, or if one comes to your door and you try to engage them and try to wake them up and show them that they're in a cult, I want to tell you, for them to be a good Mormon, one of the first steps is for them to have this public profession of having the burning in the bosom, believing the testimony of Joseph Smith. Then they're taught blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to deny that public confession. The unforgivable sin is to say, I didn't really feel anything, or I don't really believe Joseph Smith. So they're in this culture of mind control and abuse, and it's rewarded with financial gain, just as the Freemasons, if you go along with their plan. 
So they don't really want to break out of the system. They're okay with being disingenuous or insincere or lying to the crowd. They're going along to get along with all of their friends and it's working out rather well for them. There's a benefit to it. In their book, Alma 39.6, it says, For behold, if ye deny the Holy Ghost when it was when it once has had place in you, and you know that you deny it, behold, this is a sin which is unpardonable. They're saying there is no salvation if you're a Mormon and you say, I didn't really feel the burning in the bosom, or later you recant and you say, I don't believe in Joseph Smith. Now here's what it all comes down to. You say, how can I get a Mormon saved? A Mormon must deny Joseph Smith, the man they say is a god, the man they've turned into an idol. He's a false god. They must reject the false god of Joseph Smith and only trust in the Lord Jesus Christ without the Book of the Mormon and without good works for salvation. This is essential. Now you're in Revelation 22. If you would, look at verse number 18. Revelation 22, verse number 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If you add to the Bible or you take away from the Bible, you're in big trouble with God. Now listen, if you're quoting a verse and you leave something out, that's not you intentionally corrupting the Word of God. This is talking about somebody that would sit down and write something out and say, no, 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 I've got a better translation of the Bible. Let me change it to fit my lifestyle or my beliefs and take away from the things I don't like. Please go to Genesis chapter 50. This is called the authorized, or no, no, I'm sorry, they, they call it the inspired version. Genesis chapter 50, go to the last chapter in the first book, Genesis chapter 50. This inspired version is also called the Joseph Smith translation. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and again, it just hurts me to use that term because they're not the Church of Jesus Christ. I like calling them Mormons, what they are, because their God is Moroni. It's not the God of the Bible. It's not Jehovah. It's not Jesus. But they say they believe the Scriptures as far as they are translated correctly. When you talk to one on the street, they'll have a King James, but if they have one of the real big fat ones, in the back, in the last pages, they have a lot of the modifications that were made in here. And it may list it as Moses. The Bible refers to the first five books as Moses. And in Moses, when you get to Genesis chapter 50, now, there are so many changes in this Bible. There is simply not enough time for me to go through them. There is bizarre witchcraft, Satanism, homosexuality just found in the first five chapters. There are so many extra verses that were simply not there. I mean, paragraphs of information. The last, now, now think about it. If Joseph Smith is presenting himself not only as a new prophet of God that holds the keys to salvation and he is giving divine scripture, it's necessary that he would take the Bible and try to write himself into it. He does that in the New Testament in many places, but he also did it in the Old Testament. You're in Genesis 50. Look at verse number 26. Should be the last verse. Verse number 26 it says, So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. If I may read it out of this apostate version. Verse 26 says, A seer shall the Lord my God raise up, who shall be a choice seer unto the fruit of my loins. Uh, Genesis chapter 50 continues on until 38 verses in the Joseph Smith translation. In verse 33, which you don't have, it says, And that seer will I bless that they seek to destroy him shall be confounded. For this promise I give unto you, for I will remember you from generation to generation. Listen, his name shall be called Joseph. Now, if your name is Joseph Smith Jr., and you're trying to tell people I'm a prophet of God, and I should have been in the Old Testament, and I can speak Scripture, and I hold the keys of salvation, you're going to change the Bible to add your name. He literally did that. He added verses. His name shall be Joseph. But he goes on. He says, and his name shall be called Joseph, 
And it shall be after the name of his father. Oh, that's right. He was a junior, wasn't he? By his hand he shall bring my people unto salvation. If you would go to Romans chapter 4. There's so many things in here that's wrong. I really don't have time. I just want to give you a glimpse. And the goal here is so you understand what a Mormon has to give up. We're told to turn from idols and turn to the living God. And they have to do that by turning from Joseph Smith and believe in the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of the Book of Mormon. In Romans chapter 4, now in your Bible, the King James Bible, that's not missing any verses, Romans 4 is a powerful verse. Romans 4 is, is good news. That's the gospel. You know what's so good about it? It says, you know what? You're still a sinner and you can't stop your sin and God still loves you so much. He'll go on in chapter 5 and say, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And He's given us this understanding that no one in the Old Testament was saved by good works. No one in the New Testament is saved by repenting of sins or turning their life around. Romans 4 is such a, a solid platform for building our faith. Look what he says. In, I'll just read the first five verses. Verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? What did he find in the flesh? Verse 2, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. What's he saying? If I'm saved by my works, I can come to you and say I'm saved by my works, and I'm a good person, and I don't sin, and I'm better than you. But that's not true. He didn't find that. He's trying to say, what did he find by his works? If he were justified by works, he can brag, he can glory but not before God because God knows the truth. There are people out there today that teach a sinless perfection that you can stop sinning. Oh yeah, I didn't sin yesterday. That's a lie and God knows the truth. The thought of foolishness is sin and covetousness is sin and uh, I mean uh, anger and all these, there's all these things that we're guilty of just in our mind that may not manifest in drunkenness and fornication, but that still there's sins of the heart. It's a sin to not believe in Jesus. It literally tells us it's a sin to not believe the Son, he tells us in John 16. Uh, continuing in verse 3, he says, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Righteousness means to always do the right thing in God's eyes. That means perfection. We're told in the previous chapter, chapter 3, there are none righteous, no, not one. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Here he says, by believing in the promise of Jesus, you're perfect. You're perfect in God's eyes. You're sinless because Jesus paid for your sin. Verse 4, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He's trying to tell you if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. And if you don't do good works, you're still saved. That's the best news there is in the whole universe of all time. We're saved not by good works. Now in verse number four and five, allow me to read it out of this abominable translation. Now to him who is justified by the law of works is the reward reckoned not of grace but of debt, but to him that, that seeketh not to be justified by the law of works, but believeth on him who justifieth not the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You know, all you have to do is add a not here and a not there and you literally turn it upside down and you make it the opposite. You understand that Mormonism teaches you have to have good works to be saved. Ephesians 2 tells us we're saved by grace through faith. He said we're saved through faith. Well, Mormonism says we're saved by grace after all that we can do. They say it's after you do all the best that you can do. And look at verse 16 in this chapter while you're there. Verse 16, it starts out, Therefore it is of faith that it might be of grace. Now listen to the Mormon version. Therefore ye are justified of faith and works. Couldn't be any clearer they're preaching a false gospel. Or you're justified by faith and works. No, we're not justified by works before God. It just said that earlier in the chapter. They're literally contradicting themselves. Now this is important because I want you to understand this, guys. When you talk to a Mormon, you say, hey, you have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. They'll say, amen, we believe that. But I want you to know why they can speak out of both sides of their mouth. They believe in different levels of heaven. There's the terrestrial heaven, which is a contradiction. 
to reign as earth. Then they say there's a telestial heaven, kind of like telephone. Then they say there's a celestial heaven. They preach a general salvation that everybody is saved unless you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Everybody is saved. That's why they baptize for the dead and they move them up a level in heaven. That's called a general salvation. But then the individual salvation, they call it exaltation. And to get there, you have to profess that Joseph Smith was a prophet and that the Mormon, the Book of Mormon is Scripture. You have to believe that Joseph Smith is God and that he holds the keys to salvation. So they'll speak out of both sides of the mouth and they'll say, I believe in Jesus and that you can get to heaven by believing that. But they believe in a different Jesus and literally a different heaven. Why? Because they, pre they preach two Gospels. If one tries to tell you, no, I believe in Jesus and I can go to heaven, you can say, but let me ask you this. Do you have to believe in Joseph Smith to go to the celestial heaven? Because that's what they believe. And it's not just believing. You also have to do good works and do temple service. To get in the temple, you have to abide by all of their rules. Uh, Brigham Young, who followed Joseph Smith, he said, I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and that this is the gospel of salvation. If you don't believe Joseph Smith is, is the prophet, there's no salvation. He says, and if you do not believe it, you will be damned, every one of you. He said that March 29th, 1857. This Brigham Young was a pervert, and I'll just keep it mild. And 1859, October 9th, he said, Brigham Young again emphasized Smith's role as judge when he said, no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. So they say, well, you Christians are down here. You believe in Jesus and you're getting to one heaven, but us Mormons, we're going to be up here. We're going to get our own heaven. We're going to be in a whole nother realm because we believe in Joseph Smith. They're puffed up in pride because of their other gospel. September 9th, 1860, Brigham Young said, Whosoever confesseth that Joseph Smith was sent of God to reveal the holy gospel to the children of men and lay the foundation for gathering Israel and building up the kingdom of God on the earth, that spirit of God and every spirit that does not confess that God has sent Joseph Smith and revealed the everlasting gospel to and through him is of Antichrist. So now they go another step. If you don't profess Joseph Smith, you're an antichrist. Then there's Joseph Young. He was a member of the First Council of the Seventy of the Mormons. And he inserted the name of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young when he paraphrased Romans 10.9. He said, believe in God, believe in Jesus, and believe in Joseph, his prophet, and in Brigham, his successor. And I add... If you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ and Joseph was a prophet and that Brigham was his successor, ye shall be saved in the kingdom of God, which I pray in the name of Jesus may be the case. Amen. You see how bizarre this is? They're just adding Joseph Smith and adding Brigham Young wherever they come. Now, I like, I like to, in good taste, I like to mock those that are evil. And I'm not talking about scoffing the scoffers. Joseph Smith, I have a t-shirt that says Joseph's. Myth, M-Y-T-H. It's a myth. He made it up. It's a myth. Brigham Young, who married people as young as 13, 12, and 13, I've seen his name called Bring Them Young. He has a whole university out there, Brigham Young. And they teach a bunch of heresy. They teach evolution. They say it's compatible. They don't believe that God actually created any matter. They believe that God cre just used what was existing. They also teach that Adam was really God the Father. Brigham Young taught some very bizarre stuff. My last quote, Heber C. Kimball, a member of the First Presidency, said, you call us fools, but the day will be, here he goes, you're, you're making fun of us, but when you will prize Joseph Smith as the prophet of the living God and look upon him as a God and also on Brigham Young. Guys, I, I, I say all of this to help you understand this. It, it's tied to Freemasonry. There's all the secrecy. It, there's a lot of abuse. But I want you to understand a Mormon cannot be saved and also believe in Joseph Smith. They must reject Joseph Smith, 
who claims to hold the keys to salvation. He claims to be God. He claims to be a prophet that preaches his own gospel. He claims that he fixed the Bible right here and yet it contradicts every other Bible in the world. Every one! I mean, this has got to be one of the worst versions out there. There's so much stuff that's added you won't find anywhere else. And they say, well, yeah, you have to believe that God used him to give us a whole other revelation. They believe the Garden of Eden was in America. They believe that Jesus is going to come back seven different ways at seven different times, and he'll start in Missouri, and then he's going to show himself to a secret quorum of 12. Of the, and it's like, there are some really really bizarre Mormon things. And I just warn you, they also have a prophecy that in the end times when America is hanging by a thread, that one of their great leaders will step up, he'll be riding a white horse, and he will save the whole world. It's interesting that in Revelation 6, he warns us of the Antichrist who will come riding a white horse with a bow in his hand. That's part of the New World Order. As we get closer to the end times, we're going to see one man, an antichrist, and every religion will believe in him. They'll believe he's the new Messiah. They'll believe he's the Mishnah, the Maitreya, the, the, all of, I mean, the, the, the Muslims will receive him. The Catholics will receive him. The Mormons will receive him. The Jehovah's Witnesses will receive them. And many false Christians also will receive the antichrist one day. I want to end with that. I just want to give you this thought. What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Joseph Smith is a false, idolatrous God. They've made him a God. And they teach, if you're a good Mormon and you don't sin and you pay money to the temple, that you can become a God also and you can have spirit babies, and you can marry thousands of virgins in the spirit world, and you can have your own planet, and you'll be your own God. Uh, we were at the flea market yesterday, and praise the Lord, we saw three saved, but I tell the story that a few years ago we were out there, two years ago I think it was, the Mormons had their big light of the world display, and they're out there trying to convince people of a false Jesus, a false narrative. And I walked past them and I thought, ooh, I'm going to go engage these guys. And I thought, that's not what we're out here for. We're here to preach the gospel. I don't want to get in a conflict. I'm just going to go on to the bathroom. I come back and there was a lady standing there arguing with the Mormons. And she was a Christian and she had her doctrine right. And I hear it as I'm passing. And I thought, you know what? I need to go defend her. I'm going to stick up. And so I, I turned my phone on. I stuck it in my pocket. So I was recording. And I walked up and I started talking to them. And they admitted, these young men admitted that one day they would be a god. I asked them, how many gods are there? Well, for this world? No. How many gods total everywhere of all time? They can't answer that because in their theology, there's billions and billions and billions. There's no difference in that than many of the pagan Eastern religions because they also teach through Christ consciousness, you can become a god. They have it in their mind that they'll be just like Joseph Smith. They will be an ascended master. They'll be the enlightened one. And they also will become a god. It's very selfish. Next time you meet a Mormon, ask them, how many gods are there? Do you think you'll become a god? And then you flat-footed tell them, you just say, you must reject Joseph Smith. He's a false prophet. And only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray that this information would be a blessing, that it would help us to be able to defend the faith and teach the lost. Lord, I do pray that you would help us to see Mormons converted as well, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.